Hi everyone and welcome to Good Talk, New Lines Magazine's Instagram live series of conversations. My name is and I am going to invite our today's guests. Hi everyone. Okay, so we are um, live. Uh, welcome to the fifth episode of Good Talk, a new lines magazine's Instagram live series of conversation. My name is Riyad Akiol and I'm Strategic Initiatives Editor. Our today's guest is Dirk Moses, um, who is joining us from UK. I just have to say at the moment, I'm going to just um, uh, turn off these beautiful waves and <laughs> comments for this moment because we are going to put this on YouTube afterwards. If you have questions, you can mm -hmm. send. If we have um, time at the end, we will do it. So this is the fifth episode of uh, Good Talk. Dirk Moses, who's joining us from UK. He is the author of The Problems of Genocide, among other books, senior editor of Journal of Genocide Research, and the Frank Porter Graham Distinguished Professor of Global Human Rights History at University uh, of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hi, Dirk. Welcome. How are you today? Good to be with you. All, all fine here. Sunny afternoon in London. Yes. So the first thing that you told me when I sent an invitation a couple of weeks ago um, or a month ago was you said, I'm not a lawyer in the end. I'm unable to give you a legal assessment of whether genocide is happening because that's for lawyers. And you were referring to an ongoing conversation spurred or intensified after April 12 when President Biden joined uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine in accusing Russia's president Putin of committing genocide over there. And, and then, of course, it, uh, even, even more academics engaged and the conversation is ongoing. But I did appreciate your position there. And um, I know that you have been busy with many conversations and interviews regarding Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the last few months. And we will touch upon that. But I do want to start the conversation with a more theoretical one related to your um, scholarly work and what you call in a very thought provoking and provocative um, title, the problems of gen the problem of genocide. Um, can you tell our audiences shortly what is the main thesis of that book? What is the basic problem of the currently defined popular conception of genocide? Sure, sure. Well, the the title is actually plural: the problems of genocide. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, you know, one assumes that we all agree that you know the mass killing or destruction of people is a problem. You know that that we we take that for granted, and that's not what the book is about. The book is about the problem that the concept of genocide presents to us or the problems that it presents to us. And I argue that it does so in a number of ways. One is that its inventor, Raphael Lemkin, is Polish Jewish lawyer, was born around 1900, died in the mid 1950s, who invented this concept during the Second World War, that he posited it as the crime of crimes. That is the number one international crime. Uh, and certainly he regarded it as a rival to crimes against humanity, yeah, which is seen as its sort of a rival sibling. Right? So I think it's a problem that uh, people have agreed with him and that we regard genocide as the crime of crimes and therefore other international crimes of the same magnitude, that is in which the same number of people are killed, especially civilians, as less grave as, and is not as visible to us as something that's outrageous, something that, that, that does not shock the conscience of mankind which, or humanity, which is this old-fashioned legal uh, vocabulary, which often is included in the preambles to international treaties, like the resolution for the Genocide Convention in 1946 by the General Assembly of the United Nations. There's a version of that uh, at the beginning of the Human Rights Declaration from 1948, and it's in many other humanitarian-style uh, treaties, you know, on, on slavery, for example, in the 19th or 20th century. Yeah. That which shocks the conscience of mankind, we must forbid this and you know, the next, this treaty or convention. Uh, so things that, you know, the genocide shocks our conscience if people think something's genocide. But the, the, the dark side of that is that events in which, which, which are equally terrible for civilians don't shock our consciences as much if they're not legible as genocide. 
That's one problem. The other problem is that it ethnicizes the category of the civilian. So genocide pertains to, if you look at the Genocide Convention, the destruction of ethnic, racial, religious, or national groups, right? Mm -hmm. But pe people are also members of other kinds of groups, which are not mentioned there, and, and, and are often killed in their capacity, say, for transgender or, or uh, you know, members of people who have a disability or are just civilians of, of, of a nation that's being attacked for you know, military reasons. And as many of them may die, as in a, what people regard as a genocide in another case, but because it's not legally categorizable as genocide, then people think, well, that's not great, but it's just one of those things. So, mm -hmm. so only certain civilian categories are, cate are, are captured by genocide. And, and what it does is it ethnicizes our political imaginary that humans are only regarded as members, as important in ter insofar as they're members of ethnic groups. Now, mm -hmm. that's true in many cases, but it's, all, it's not true in many cases. Mm -hmm. So they're the two main problems of genocide. Now, the issue is, is that once you have this hierarchy in mm -hmm. international per perceptions of criminality with genocide at the top, then those other categories of civilians fall away, fall from view. Mm -hmm. And also what happens when we focus on individual criminal responsibility rather than the state mechanisms, which are very complex? Okay, well, we, we're getting into legal territory here, uh, which we have to, uh, because mm -hmm. it, you know, genocide is a legal concept as well as a historical sociological one, okay? And Lemkin designed it as such, because he mm -hmm. wanted to write you know, a world history of genocide, but he also wanted a, a, an international law of genocide. And you know, th those, those imperatives can be intention. Now, individuals are placed on trial for crimes like genocide, not states, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yet we know that individuals who are allegedly committing genocide will be doing so in their capacity as state functionaries, whether as uh, government ministers or in the military and so forth, and that there's a whole apparatus that has, has uh, been mobilized to, to you know, ethnically cleanse civilians or shoot all the men like in Srebrenica or, and then deport the women. You know, there's, it's a much more complex conjuncture of, of government agencies and military forces. And uh, a lot of that disappears from view in certainly terms of criminal prosecutions if, uh, if we're just focusing on the one bad guy. And what it also does negatively is it, it, it underlines the misperception that one or two bad people are responsible for genocide rather than, you know, mm -hmm. an underlying ideology or the, the state and security imperatives of a of a of an entire government and a deep state apparatus, you know, which uh, which remain in place even after uh, said person is prosecuted. That is why, yeah, that's absolutely why I asked because it seems that we, um, it, it's very easy for uh, states or regime afterwards to manipulate this idea that oh it was that individual it was not yeah. bigger a bigger thing which we have seen um in in many instances but, but then we get to the very important part which is also the subtitle of your book um and given these problems you suggest that the genocide concept should be replaced with this uh, more general term of permanent security and, and you say that you didn't invent it you even explained that it was the nazi commander Otto Ollendorf who um, used it. And so how is it then that, as you write, this permanent security is um, kind of, a, the, the current definition is uh, obscuring the permanent security logic through the language of transgression. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are very important terms that might sound complicated to general audience, but it's very important to, mm. um, you know, explain them. And then it makes much more sense sure i'll i will explain it uh because you know in in the abstract it is uh it, it's hard to pin down so let me first explain what the language of transgression is as i argue in the book so the the general view is that lemkin who was this international lawyer refugee lawyer you know much of whose family died in the holocaust a terrible experience for him as for many other refugee and immigrant scholars that he was sort of a legal genius who invented the concept of genocide in the 1940s to name the crime that the Nazis were committing that no one had ever seen before. Uh, and so he was, in a sense, inventing, allowing us to see something that 
we hadn't seen before. Now, I think that's wrong. And I proceed, I proceed as an historian to show that over the last 500 years, uh, at least in the West, where my own historical expertise lie, that there's, there'd been an intensive discussion, international discussion about naming and condemning state criminality and colonial criminality you know, for 500 years since, since mm -hmm. the Spanish and uh, Portuguese conquest of Latin and South America. So that's, you know, really since the 16th century. Uh, being, you know, there were a, a, a lot of scandals at the time. Las Casas wrote about these. And that's where the term shocking the conscience of mankind really, really comes from. Mm -hmm. as I, and I call that the language that people use to condemn state and colonial atrocities. I call that the language of transgression because they're transgressing our norms. OK, what Lemkin does with the genocide concept, if you sort of trace his intellectual development, is he takes this very, this very, dynamic conversation uh, about condemning state crimes, which are, you know, atrocities, excesses, uh, which included slavery and as well as massacres and forced labor um, and dis simplified it radically it, with this concept of genocide. So rather than inventing something out of a whole cloth, he was actually simplifying a discourse that was already out there, uh, uh, the language of transgression. And the problem with the genocide concept is that by, by, making the Holocaust its archetype, it sets the threshold of that which shocks the conscience of mankind much higher than it used to be. So now people are only shocked by something that somehow is analogous with the Holocaust. And that's why so many victim groups uh, uh, can't resist making analogies with the Holocaust. They say, we are like the Jews of Africa, or they, they treated us like the Nazis treated us like the Jews, uh, because that's, that's the, 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 the gold standard of a, of a genocide. OK, and you see this again and again in in the advocacy for proving a genocide. It's like the Holocaust. But because the Holocaust is regarded by many as unprecedented, singular or even unique, by definition, it's very hard to make that analogy. Hmm. Right. So that's why since the Second World War, we've had this paradox of a genocide convention since 1948. So there's an international legal norm uh, about genocide. And yet we've seen you know, virtually every couple of years, a genocide-like event or series mm -hmm. of events. Uh, right now, we could consider, you know, there's a debate about Ukraine. There's a debate about what happened in Myanmar a few years ago with the expulsion of the Rohingya. There's a mm -hmm. debate going on right now about the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, right? Right now, although genocide is less used in this context, you know, there's, there's horrific civilian destruction in Yemen, also in Eritrea. Uh, with the, not in Eritrea, sorry, in Ethiopia, with the Tigray mm -hmm. province. And in South Sudan, there's all kinds of uh, humanitarian crises which are related to uh, non-international armed conflict. Uh, and genocide is less, less usually attached to that conflict, but, you know, it's somehow it's not on our radar, which is also one of the problems of genocide. So this, this concept is not doing that much work for us because it's very hard to make these cases stick as genocide in law which is a, 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 an issue we can get to next, if you like. So remind me of your, uh, your question about where, 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 how it's I ended about, up here. Yeah, yeah it, was the, it was about language of transgression and, and right. why the violence is always yeah. you know, kind of the result so the of permanent, the, the Yeah, the yeah. permanent security. So the, the, the other half of the argument, apart from showing how genocide is, in a sense, a simplification of a much broader tradition of talking about genocide and, and, it, and it makes it harder to prove, is that... Uh, that what the argument is that which actually drives states to commit all these types of violence, including mm -hmm. the ones that we don't call genocide, mm -hmm. is, is the imperative, the utopian imperative for permanent mm -hmm. security, which may sound benign to people. It is actually deeply utopian and sinister because nothing can be permanent. States naturally want to you know, secure their populations, their borders and so forth. But it's the desire for permanence that, you know, never again will we be vulnerable from our neighbors or never again will we allow this minority within our borders to be a fifth column, to be an insurgent and so forth. That's the problem. Now, what that leads to is a logic of preemption by the security apparatuses and in anticipating future threats in order to in order to make sure that there's permanent security. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, there, were, there were some, if you like, separatists in Uyghurs, in the Uyghur case in Xinjiang, but few. And like there were in uh, Rakhine province in 
in Myanmar, okay? Right. But in both cases, the states completely overreact. I mean, they're entitled to suppress an insurgency and bandits, if you like, or people who engage in terroristic style violence. They're totally entitled to do that in the name of security. But where it escalates to become illegitimate, in my view, and become uh, at the aim of permanent security is when they try to have a, if you like, final solution so that never mm. again will there be a source of an insurgency. So they have two different solutions. In the case of the Uyghurs, they've decided to incarcerate a large proportion of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang province in order to, you know, to re-educate them and so forth, as well as apparently try to limit the birth rate through the use of IUDs and sterilization and so forth. This is all debated at the time, but at the moment, but there seems to be quite a lot of evidence for it, and it's extremely alarming. And some people are trying to say this is a genocidal policy. Now, in the so that but that's an internal solution, right? You 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 discipline, if not try to destroy this group that remain within your borders. In the Myanmar case, they've opted for a kind of a genocidal expulsion. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've pushed most of the, the population into, into Bangladesh. Okay. So, but the outcome, the attempt is the same, or the, the logic is the same. So never again will we allow this uh, ethnically different population to produce from within its ranks uh, insurgents. Never again. So that, it, it's, that logic recurs of never again, of anticipating future threats in all these other cases. Now, the problem is the Genocide Convention doesn't get at that logic of state the genocide of state preemption. The genocide convention says that it's the attempt to destroy an ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. As such. And that, yeah, this, as you know, for this article I wrote on the Ukraine case, the, the as such was inserted in there uh, through a series of negotiations and compromises in 1947 and 1948 as the UN was wrangling about, you know, what is genocide, was inserted in there in order to posit the proposition or to nail it down that groups are attacked solely on the basis of their race or their ethnic or national difference, not for anything they've done or, any, or anything their members may have done, like launch an insurgency, but just for being different. So on the grounds of hate. So genocide is, if you like, a, a massive hate crime. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out in virtually all these cases, where, well, in all these cases in the post-war world, they are occurring in the context of some kind of armed conflict. So the states that are committing this violence will always argue, and they usually get away with it, that we are putting down an insurgency or we're defending ourselves from an invasion and or a future invasion, as the Ukraine case uh, gets at, and which we'll talk about. And uh, we're entitled within, uh, we're entitled to this because every state has a right to defend itself. So, of course, it's a fudge because international law does allow a right of self-defense, but that's against an imminent threat you know, like the, the, the armies massed on the other side of the border, right? right? Not about a fantasized future threat, you know, which is what the Russians are doing, right? But, you know, the, the security services of any state have to predict future threats, that's their job. But that means they engage in a process of uh, catastrophization, if you like. It catastrophizes international relations. And it becomes kind of paranoid because, you know, if you just say, if we analogize with an individual walking down the street, you know, in theory, anyone who's coming uh, your way, you know, a pedestrian could stab you. So uh -huh. if you have that mentality, uh, you, this is, of course, people are paranoid delusions. They actually preemptively attack someone before they can be attacked. But they then actually elicit the defensive reaction from the person they've attacked and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and you see this, this, this kind of uh, this course of events again and again. And the Genocide Convention is not equipped for this logic this political logic, which we see playing out, it, it has a it has a view of genocide that is modelled on the Holocaust, in which, in fact, European Jews were attacked uh, and hadn't been doing anything. You know, they were they were passive civilians, okay, but they were attacked preemptively in the Nazi crazy uh, worldview for being, you know, partisans or being being potential supporters of Bolshevism and in the in 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 their view. Uh, so there was this preemptive logic. In fact, Otto Ohlendorf, the, 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 the Nazi SS uh, Einsatzgruppen leader, who used this term permanente Sicherheit or permanent security, mm -hmm. uh, came out with this term when he was asked about the execution of Jewish children. He said, you have to understand we're not interested just in regular security. 
military security, but permanent security. We're erecting a thousand year Reich here and those Jewish children could grow up to become partisans. You know, they'll find out what happened to their parents and they'll, they'll oppose us. And when I read that in the Nuremberg trial transcripts, as someone who studies and writes about colonial history, I was instantly reminded of the chilling uh, slogan which you appear, appeared in the US West, you know, as the frontier was expanding, of nits make lice, which some of your listeners may have heard. Nits are baby lice you know, insects in your hair, right? I, I don't have them because I don't have any hair. But the, the, the logic was that you, you kill, I mean, this is terrible, you kill uh, Native American children because uh, they could grow up to become warriors or bear warriors, you know, if they're girls, right? And in that way, we have permanent peace, quote unquote, peace. In, and we win, we win the frontier wars. So I saw that, you know, the Nazi logic here had anal analogies, analogies with the settler colonialism. And, you know, we had the same logics playing out and patterns of events playing out in Australia too. You've got to kill the babies or, or you take the indigenous children and you sort of raise them in Western institutions so they become culturally white. And that does destroy the nation, as it were. I've had so many thoughts coming to different parts of this um, long response. Well, the first one being that, you know, good talk can sometimes be hard talk, but the good talk should always be meaningful talk, which is my aim and which was my aim in, in inviting you here um, and having this conversation because of so many different alleys that, that you opened for thinking, um, both in terms of history and present as well. And uh, I, want to mention that as you write there's a lot of there, there are different processes of racialization that um, have gone through history especially when we speak about these groups and identities um, as well and that is important and so I thought it was very interesting how when you describe permanent security you also talk about illiberal and liberal permanent security. And especially because obviously New Lines magazine <laughs> features the best writing from the Middle East and beyond. I was, uh, I saw that you invoked and you use the term of Yasin uh, El Hajj Saleh, uh, who wrote for our magazine, the Syrian dissident intellectual, where, and you write how um, he says that, for example, for us as regime, in terms of illiberal permanent security, such regimes are genocratic because they represent the rule of a genos rather than the demos, and they will stay uh, terror to entrench their power. So I thought that yes. was uh, very important in terms of a specific example. Uh, and, and we'll get to the idea of potential solution because this preemptive idea of permanent state security is so dangerous when you hear it the way that you describe it because yeah. it could be a form or a manifestation of a genuine paranoia, but it could be the subject of such a intense and dangerous political manipulation um, that, that so many leaders could, could use. But yeah. could you just briefly tell us what do you think is the difference between this liberal and illiberal sure. Term security? Sure. Now, that's a very important distinction to make, and I'm glad you've raised it. Mm -hmm. It's something that the, the, the security argument haunted me for many years because I, I saw it in the, in the sources of, of, of any mass violence. You know, the, the perpetrators always think they're behaving in, and acting in self-defense. Mm. Which is not, which is not, you know, our view of these things from the outside. You know, we there are, the, there are these fanaticized regimes, and they're wicked people, and they're doing wicked deeds, which which indeed they are doing, right? But once you you try to get inside their heads, you realize that you know they regard their country as surrounded by enemies, and they're acting in self defense, and they felt they had no no alternative. Okay, now that doesn't mean we need to. In understanding that, doesn't mean we accept their views as legitimate, right? We need to have a toolbox to be able to get inside their heads, but then get outside it as well. You can't just reproduce the perpetrator perspective and, and uh, say, well, you know, they, they were just a bit misled, right? We mm -hmm. need to have a perspective that allows us to, to uh, look at it critically and analytically. And, but the problem with, with just using this concept of permanent security on its own without disaggregating it is that you can end up equating, say, as some people on the far left do, you know, American empire and the Nazi empire, you know, and then people will say erroneously, in my view, you know, the Americans in Iraq were behaving just like the Nazis, you know, which is just, it's just not true. It's just analytically uh, inaccurate and as well as politically, I think, misleading. Mm -hmm. Now, 
but the fact is, is that all kinds of empires, including Western liberal ones, have been killing lots of people in different ways for hundreds of years in, in terms of violent expansion, you know, whether in uh, the settler colonialism in, in Australia or in North America, parts of Africa, uh, as well as the expansion of Russia throughout, you know, the, the Eurasia in different in East and West. Uh, think of think of the uh, the fate of the Circassians in the middle of the 19th century, or the or the people in the North Caucasus, Chechens, English, Dagestani's, and so forth. Uh, think of think of Serbian expansionism in in um, in the Balkans, uh, with these you know these historical images of Greater Serbia that justifies you know uh, entitlement to land, and then you know. That means that the, the non-Serbs living there aren't really indigenous and so forth. And this all has terrible consequences, as we all know. Now, the, the problem is that, or the analytical issue is that empires do expand and conduct their security in different ways. And they do, they do their justificationary rhetoric, it varies. Now, the Western liberal empires, uh, the British, the French and so forth in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, did so, you know, in the name of humanity, as the American, if you want to use the term American empire, does to today. You know, we're doing this for the good of everyone. You know, our interests are, uh, sim uh, are synonymous with those of humanity as a whole. And they will uh, tend to use coercive means that are consistent with international law on the whole. But they also have designed international law to allow a lot of violence to be conducted legally. And that's why, for example, you know, warfare is not illegal and the, the military necessity as a, as a doctrine, which allows the killing of many civilians as collateral damage is, is legal. OK, uh, people will say, well, you know, this is it's a regrettable like aspect. Of... Mm. Go ahead. Like drones, for example. Right? Correct. It's a classic mm. case. Now, the, they're not committing genocide in the way the Nazis did. Right. It mm. tends to be lower scale low intensity violence, certainly not for the victims, right? But in terms of the scale, right? Lots of pinprick killings, but over time. Mm. Now, if you're engaged in per a permanent global war on terror, then you are basically accepting through this doctrine of military necessity and its allowance of large scale collateral damage, the permanent killing of civilians in the name of your security. You know, in, and the, don't forget the global war on terror was a security operation. So, and the logic is this, it was also the war in Vietnam logic, you know, in order to safeguard, say, you living there in DC, which is where I presume you are, me living in North Carolina, where I am most of the time, uh, we need to have missiles flying around Northwest Pakistan, or, or parts of other parts, or parts of the Middle East, uh, uh, killing terrorists, potential terrorists, and anyone around them, including their families. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's untenable. And I, and I'm, and, but I'm analytically interested in, in how people, how the law allows that. Okay. Now that's liberal permanent security because it's in the name of humanity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Illiberal permanent security is perpetrated by illiberal regimes. And the Nazis are the perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. They don't do it in the name of humanity, but in the name of Germans, right? It's a particularistic uh, uh, justification. And they are much less scrupulous about international law. So yes, let's like the Russians today, right? Let's let's obliterate a, a, a nation uh, for our, our own security. You know, we're not interested. In, I mean, occasionally the Russians do talk about humanity and international law, but we all know that's uh, uh, this is propaganda. No, they they're interested in um, you know Greater Russia, you know, and uh, you know it may have a role to play in in in, in global in global affairs, but it's done in the name of Russia, not in the name of humanity mm. and it and it violates international law but what what listeners need to appreciate at least from my argument is that i'm not arguing in favor of international law here i'm saying international law as it's currently structured is part of the problem in two ways one is that it does enable uh, the large scale killing of civilians and that's what liberal security enables and be or is licensed by and secondly the way that you know genocide is coupled with these other atrocity crimes crimes against humanity war crimes and ethnic cleansing you know uh, doesn't cover all the aspects of the uh 
can, you know, the, the kind of metaphorical, if you like, criminality that states are engaged in covers a lot of it, but, but not all. And, but once you have this hierarchy uh, with genocide at the top, as I began with, then the others fall from view as less grave. I mean, that's why Zelensky did reach for genocide, you know, because it's rhetorically such, like it, you know, uh, so powerful. Lem and, and, uh, and, and Biden backed him, incidentally, on the same day as they promised to deliver heavy weapons. I'm sure it wasn't a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, which I want, which all like throughout the reading of your book and different essays, I know also what do you respond to critics, but I want the listeners to also hear what do you respond to your critics, because I know you have a lot of supporters and a lot of critics, depending on the kind of conversation that you are engaged in or historically yeah. uh, or the topic uh, in different contexts. And, and I know that there is a, which should be, I guess, the, the conversation, but what do you say to those um, scholars or others who might say, you know, what the civilian destruction cannot be compared to genocide because the purpose mm. of genocide is to destroy peoples, but this other one is, you know, to defeat the enemies and then uh, yeah. something inevitable happens uh, in that process. And, and um, all those who follow you online, thanks to social media can sometimes, you know, observe, I see different exchanges uh, with, with different scholars. And I think it's a dynamic conversation uh, that, that goes on. But what, and we'll get to Ukraine again in terms of the campaign. And, and I'm getting different also um, sense that you are unsatisfied, you want to, we'll talk about what you propose, whether it's changing. I don't think it's kind of impossible to change the concept of genocide because it's so popular, the conception mm. is so important, I mean, ingrained in our popular um, usage, so to speak. But what do you, let's get to this. What do you respond to your critics who, who say this, that you just can't compare it, Dirk? Yeah, so I'll just repeat that for the for the listeners. So a common argument is that you can't compare, for example, genocide with the, the atomic destruction, bomb destruction of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, which was a debate in the 1970s and 80s, which I you know reconstruct in, in the latter parts of the book. So, you know, the argument is from from those that are interested in this this fusion of uh, concepts is that well, you know, nuclear weapons and atomic weapons can kill uh, millions of people. So why, why should that be really analytically distinct from genocide? I tend to be sympathetic to that argument. So where warfare and genocide become blended, okay? That, mm -hmm. I'm sympathetic to that argument. The, the critics of that argument, which is what you're referring to, say that there, although warfare can kill as many civilians as, as genocide, they're analytically distinct, conceptually distinct, because genocide aims to destroy a people, whereas warfare in terms to defeat an enemy. And when, when the, the war is over, then the, then the killing stops. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, uh, I'm uncomfortable with that argument because if you, if you are prioritizing the welfare of civilians, which is the normative standard for, for, for everyone, then then what use is this distinction if as many civilians are being killed? And in fact, as I said, with this idea of permanent warfare, this is a permanent killing of civilians going on in the name of our security here on the east coast of the US. Okay? But because it's not legible as genocide, people, mm. people don't care that much. Now, occasionally, you know, when the New York Times does a story or a series of stories, as it did in Jan uh, December and January recently, about the drone strikes that went wrong in Iraq and in Afghanistan, you know, there's a controversy in the newspaper for a couple of weeks, but then it disappears. You know, it's not an ongoing emergency. But I tell you what, if you're living in those countries that are being terrorized by drones, it is an ongoing mm -hmm. form of terror. It's a, fo it's a form of ongoing state terror. But that's not experiential for people living in their comfortable houses and apartments uh, in Western countries in whose security, for whose security this is being, uh, these campaigns are being undertaken. You know, I find that troubling. I find that troubling. So I think these sort of very academic debates about, you know, is it this logic or that logic, miss a, a broader empirical point here about what is actually happening in the world in the name of uh, liberal permanent security, okay? Let me also say this. The, the, you know, the, 
in Myanmar has is being hauled beyond over the coals for uh, genocide. You know, the, in, I think the ICJ there's a case by the Gambia arguing that, and 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 many agree that this is uh, a genocide. But it's so it's so capricious. You know, why will that? Why can that stick? But it can't stick in the case at the moment for for Xinjiang for the Chinese. Well, there's a lot of real politics as well. Like, what's the chance of prosecuting any permanent member of the Security Council? for excesses that they commit. I mean, zero. We know that, right? So that's another probably the side issue we can, we can uh, discuss later. Now that you, I mean, you mentioned Uyghurs, and on um, May 25, Raihan Asad, who is an international human rights lawyer of Uyghur origin, she penned a piece, an essay, Why do we, When Do We Call Russia's Atrocities a Genocide? That was published on um, Lawfare blog website. And she wrote also... Uh, about her so as she says constant agony of losing her brother as well Ekbar Asad to um, mm. Chinese uh, persecution um, and so she constantly of course has contributed and is continues seeking accountability for for that but she goes on and explains the situation that was going on with uh, Ukraine at the moment how IGC International Criminal Court um, prosecutor has opened an investigation and then she does explain for her perspective something that you addressed because of the current perception of the genocide um, as you've said any violence that's short of that mass murder may not convince the audience even though everything that we have seen about Uyghurs has been so uh, brutal and, and with Ukraine mm. we had more from Bucha from Kiev and who yeah. knows any more mass graves so yeah yeah so, so as she said and you pointed and emphasized, we have legal scholars who continue having this conversation and, and specifically this ma uh, narrow definition of, of the mass murder. And she quoted you there uh, and your uh, essay from, from a couple of weeks before that. So what does, in your opinion, specifically Ukraine um, genocide debate reveal in terms of what you say are limits of international law, specifically that you say the problem is not necessarily misunderstandings of Lemkin, but um, the character of the post-war memory culture, as you say. Yeah. And yeah. I just want to say for the listeners and viewers that this is such a complicated and difficult conversation. And, and I'm Bosniak, but I read, and we're speaking about Rehan and Uyghurs, and you have you know, cited cases from history, from colonial uh, brutality and and, it's really difficult, sensitive conversation. And, and I, um, as an external observer of the academic debates, uh, participate by learning in humility and always kind of trying to understand the complexity of this. Mm. Uh, and I just need to, you know, um, say out loud how I can only imagine how currently it is difficult for Ukrainians to be even witnessing this conversation, yeah. honestly, yeah. Um, and yeah. we don't in any way, and I don't think that even scholars who are engaged in, in these discussions for a second put aside the brutality of it. I think this is yeah. a scholarly debate that, it, that has been going on and goes on, but uh, what do you say about this? And, and, and also, as we've seen, you, we've had scholars like Eugene Finkel, uh, who even I think yesterday, I want to point to the a dynamic conversation, how it's changing. He, yes, wrote a piece in Washington Post a month ago, but he, for example, just yesterday posted a tweet as a reminder saying, uh, as a comment to the news that all babies born in Kherson region after February 24th and orphans are moved and given Russian uh, citizenship. And, and he commented that by reminding mm. that we, we know that it's forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, our acts explicitly covered by the Genocide Convention. So this conversation is ongoing and moving. Yeah, right? yeah, they are. I've been thinking a lot about the deportation of uh, Ukrainians to Russia and also the, the um, if you like, kidnapping of children and then raising them as Russian. And indeed, the last article of uh, the Genocide Convention where, where the definition is contained uh, does talk about the transfer of children as a, a genocidal act, but it's only if it's in relation to the intention to destroy the group in whole or in part as such. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the act itself is not enough. That's the actus reus. You need the mens rea, which is the intention. And proving the intention is always the hard part. Okay. And that's where the jury is out. What are the Russians trying to achieve with this? Look, uh, this is the, these are the kinds of arguments you may have if you had a, a trial down the road, right? Just say uh, 10,000 Ukrainian babies were taken to Russia and raised as, raised as Russian, okay? Uh, what's the population of Ukraine? 44 million? So, you know, the defense lawyer may argue that, that this is no way this could contribute to the destruction of the Ukrainian nation. It's a, it's a drop in the ocean, horrible as it is for the families, right? Okay? who have lost their children. But, you know, these are the kind of <laughs> debates that, that occur in the, in the courtroom, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the debate is ongoing. And my contribution was, was not to get into the question of, yes, no, is this genocide, okay? Mm -hmm. This is something that, you know, that's why I, I wrote to you about international lawyers really being mm -hmm. the people to ask here. There's a lot of very technical legal issues mm -hmm. here, which I'm, I, I confess I'm not on top of. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, th there's material to read on that, including this report that, that was produced that you referred to. Now, what interested me is, A, why do people feel that they need to resort to the genocide concept to get attention? You know, why, is, why isn't crime against humanity a crime against humanity, which is much easier to prove because you don't need this intention. You just need to show that the act occurred. Right? Why isn't that enough? You know, so I'm stepping back here and analyzing the way the discourse is structured. And the way our emotions are colonized, uh, uh, Riada. You know, why, why have we been conditioned to be outraged by something by, that is possibly genocidal, but not, not outraged as much by a crime against humanity? For example, when the, uh, the UN uh, issued a report in 2005 about what was going on in Darfur, in Sudan, and said these were uh, crimes against humanity and the crime of persecution, the, there were sort of audible sighs of relief from Khartoum and also for many members of the African Union. So nothing to see here, just some crimes against humanity. It's not genocide. Everybody just calm down. Okay? Now, I think that's a deplorable state of affairs in, in international society. That what, you know, what looked to us, to me, like the, the, the Armenian genocide, was, was seen as, you know, quote unquote, only crimes against humanity. Now, I must stress that within the international law and in the UN system, there is actually no hierarchy of crimes. You know, genocide isn't considered more grave than crimes against humanity and war crimes. However, in practice and in the way the media reacts and, and politicians and so forth, there is such a, there is such a hierarchy. And I go into some detail about this in the book, you know, with quotation after quotation, uh, inducing uh, evidence for that fact. So I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by the way that we talk about these things. Now, that's one aspect. The other aspect is this. In Lemkin's original definition of genocide in a book he produced during the Second World War about the access Nazi-led occupation of Europe, uh, he defined genocide very broadly as a technique of occupation to destroy a nation uh, through various means, which included you know, deportation of, and destruction of elites, the changing of language, you know, street signs, the destruction of the local economy, uh, the taking of children, uh, the settlement of the area by one's own nationals after deporting uh, the defeated people, uh, as well as mass murder and you know, the, what we think of as, uh, as uh, biological genocide. So it's much broader. Now, all this cultural genocide and economic warfare, that was all stripped out when it became a law in the United Nations. So it became much narrower. Uh, and so if we had Lemkin's original definition of genocide, I don't think there's any shadow of a doubt that the Russian campaign in Ukrainian would be genocidal. But this, this is the subversive message I, I give to you and your reader. The, the states of the world in negotiating the genocide convention defined it so narrowly, precisely, so they could v wage this kind of colonial warfare uh, mm. in, the context, in the context of the Cold War and the impending decolonization struggles, uh, mm. which were already sort of happening in the, in the late 1940s. They wanted to be able to engage in permanent security campaigns and, and, not, and get away with it and not be beholden or be subject to an international court. I mean, there wasn't an international court until the ICC came along. I mean, that's not an accident. And it's not some kind of outcome of paralysis in the United Nations. 
It's because none of the great powers want to have their soldiers and uh, officials be subject to the sovereign power of somebody else. Okay. Uh, and that's why they dominate the Security Council. So they're, you know, sovereign with a really capital S. Okay. Now, uh, we have precedents for the kind of warfare that's going on in, in Russia, in, by Russia and Ukraine. I mean, the war, the American war on, on Vietnam, although conducted in, with slightly different rhetoric, uh, you know, there wasn't the attempt for a permanent occupation, for example, it wasn't meant to be part of America in the same way that Ukraine's supposed to be annexed and become part of Russia. But still, the style of warfare, uh, you know, was appalling. And, uh, and many at the time did talk about it being genocide. But because it, it didn't look like the Holocaust, and indeed, it doesn't look like the Holocaust, uh, it was, you know, not considered in the end to be genocide, you know, by broad consensus, you know, although millions of people died. And the, the Americans dropped far more bombs in Indochina than they did in the Second World War on the Germans and the Japanese. You know? uh, and only a few, a few years earlier, they killed millions of North Koreans in the war there through saturation bombing. Okay? But once again, it's completely forgotten. It's never taught in the genocide course because it's not legible as genocide. And I'm not saying it's genocide. What I'm saying is the fact that we're obsessed with genocide and can't see these other cases as a problem, that is a problem of genocide. And the Russians will get away with a lot of their a lot of it, not all, but a lot of their war military conduct, because they'll say that, you know, bombing of the city or parts of the city were a military target. Yes, mm -hmm. there happened to be there happened to be civilians there, but there were soldiers in there, too. And once you get that mixture of civilians and combatants in in, mm -hmm. uh, in place, then there's a lot of leeway for collateral damage cal calculations, which are also Western powers do. A lot of their indiscriminate bombing will be illegal, I think, as a war crime, because there's no way they're making an attempt to even distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. So other parts of international law will cover them. But, you know, whether in practice they'll ever be up a, uh, before a court is another question. I mean, these are such um, complex, complicated conversations that impact so many people in so many ways. And I do also want to, now that we speak about technicality, is one that, that I think is important to mention um, and certain, and we've had New Lines Institute recently in the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights published a report uh, where authors and experts reasonably concluded, as they said, quote unquote, that Russia bears state responsibility for breaches of Article 2 and 3 of the genocide convention to which is bound meaning the important result is that the as report concludes there exists undoubtedly a very serious risk of genocide triggering states duty to prevent under article one of the genocide convention mm -hmm. so what will happen afterwards in terms of accountability and whether this helps is a separate conversation the other that con that from my understanding, legally right now, regardless of what ends up uh, being uh, accounted for afterwards, it is important that there are mechanisms that trigger states around the world to prevent what's mm. going on. Now, how does that, what does that manifest as and what it should and could manifest is a different conversation, which, and there is a lot out there. Uh, but I, I do want to ask you um, and go, kind of get towards the um end of the conversation respecting your time um how i feel like you ended your book on a pessimist tone or maybe it, it sounded like it was with a pessimist tone is that true or what was what was your hope after the book or how have you seen the conversations moving and also just one thing i think that uh, and you're not obviously the only one i think that even eugene finkel i think who is a very respected uh, scholar he's also not happy with a narrow definition of genocide even though he says there is mm. absolutely no doubt that what's going on so i think that this conversation about maybe the expansion to is maybe more conducive to results rather than completely obviously mm. replacing it in my personal opinion um and again a, a lot of things kept coming to my mind while you were speaking one is, for example, that in case of Bosnian genocide, only Srebrenica massacre mm. was legally counted as genocide. But what about Prijedor? What about Visegrad? What about all those other massacres that, mm. are, that have such brutal consequences? And that is that problem about the proving the intent. And these people who, you know, talk and orchestrate genocide are not stupid people. The bureaucratization and everything that's going on. So mm. this is... Um, so complicated, but but am I right? Were you? Are you? I'm a pessimist by nature, which uh, I don't know. I don't want to be. But how are you seeing these conversations 
moving um and and what was your hope with the book so i i am pessimistic uh i see that uh, a world structured by states is inevitably going, inevitably going to be one in which uh, and in the states are rivals with each other so here i'm a kind of a realist that the that paranoid delusions about uh impending invasion and subversion you know will 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 seize many of their security apparatuses and they will in, indulge in permanent security campaigns we see that uh, with all these cases that we've been mentioning you know whether they qualify as genocide or not and that's the point that the the, the attempt to be safe forever whether within or without outside their borders is one that drives their policy and and is leading is leading to these excesses of state you know wh whether it's in the in the guise of an armed conflict like in in ukraine or where it's an internal repression which is not a military case it's not even a civil war like in china okay so the common denominator the denominator there is the solution for permanent security and what i'm saying is that that's hard hard baked into the dna of our world system okay so and the problem with the genocide concept among the many that we've covered today is that it only identifies some aspects of permanent security okay and not and not others you know it's when victims are racialized as a nation and when uh uh you know somehow fits the categories of the genocide convention but there are many other cases of of you know say messier conflicts like in yemen where genocide isn't the right really the right term uh certainly it's not as legible as genocide but you know equal numbers if not more civilians are being killed you know through blockades and starvation and so forth uh you know why why isn't that picked up uh, by international law in the same way why is it not on our radar so you know that those problems aren't going away they're, they're kind of permanent features of our international system so what i'm proposing in a utopian move is to replace or augment the because it's hard to get rid of these treaties once they're there right but to augment it with uh, say a convention on criminalizing permanent security now i know people will say oh it's a you know, utopian and a possible idea well you know it's good to even start the conversation because the virtue of talking about security with states is because for them that's a language of legitimation they say we 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 are delegated by our populations to keep them safe and we are conducting whatever campaign in the name of security and they think that legitimizes everything well if you say that's okay but permanent security is illegitimate let's have a conversation about your security excess as illegitimate then then you you catch them out because what they always say is that we're not committing genocide this is a security operation that's what the turks say with the armenian case you know over 100 years ago that's what the the myanmar case state is saying you know there were terrorists which there were uh, some among the rakhine uh, population of uh, of um, rohingya and uh, so we were within our rights to expel them okay now of course they they can't justify the excess because it's the utopian ideal of permanence they did attack people who were weren't involved in military operations because they were trying to prevent future threats as we explained before but they you need to pin them down on their illegitimate security concerns and then have a debate about what's legitimate and illegitimate security okay uh, and we're not having that debate we're we're having a debate about whether something fits a genocide convention or not it's for me it's for me it's a distraction from what the real issues are now of course the real issues are that we want to get at are the are the suffering of civilians as you know you were getting at that i think in the middle of our talk where you were saying you were hinting i think at all these sort of arcane academic debates when you know out there people women children men are being killed or expelled and tortured okay now but as academics because i'm not in the field as a as a military participant you know it's my job to try to understand what the hell is going on and why it's happening and the genocide optic distracts us in many ways from from that because you know we're focusing on you know russian hatred for ukrainians which is plenty of evidence for that by the way you know racialization issues are are, are a problem in many places of course it's it's inverted in that case because they they're saying they actually like us we're not hating another we want we want them to join us we don't want to kill 
and expel the other. We want to absorb them. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated to, case that's not typical of many other, you know, genocidal conjunctures. I am, I am pessimistic, though, because the chances of getting a, a, a convention that strikes at the heart of states to do what they want without limits in regarding to state security is very low because it's in the DNA of what a state, what makes a state. On that note, um, I want to invite everyone to keep following the coverage from Ukraine uh, that we at New Alliance Magazine have been uh, really dedicated to with our reporters from the ground. Um, and we have seen more and more uh, official statements that could be counted as clear intent uh, from Russian officials. We have a lot of um, sites and many, who knows how many, un un undiscovered mass graves. Um, mm -hmm. These are difficult conversations. You will continue having them in your scholarly circus, circles, um, and um, it is important to keep following it. I hope that um, the violence in Ukraine stops as, as soon as possible, but it was important to kind of cover the broad picture, um, which is very complicated and difficult. Some good talks are harder than others, but hard talks are still good talks. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and um, uh, this will be posted later on. Um, I appreciate your time. Good to talk with you. I know it's troubling stuff and um, you know, I've really appreciated your question so we can get to the heart of the issues. Thank you, Dirk. And thank you to okay. all who stayed here. Have a good day and stay tuned with uh, New Lines Magazine. Good talk.